Welcome to the Barrel Room Chronicles. I'm Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward, former bartender, and all-around whiskey aficionado. I travel the world to explore whiskey from every avenue. For the last 20 years, I've been helping others tell their stories through television, film, and other media. But now, I'm taking my love for whiskey and my experience in the entertainment industry to uncover the fascinating stories of the water of life. So kick off your shoes, pour yourself a dram, and join me for this premiere episode as I speak with Irish whiskey maker Bernard Walsh, founder of the Walsh Whiskey Company. First, we'll take a peek inside the Dram Diaries. The history of whiskey begins in Ireland around 1000 AD, when Christian monks brought distilling techniques back from the Mediterranean. They then modified the techniques to create a drinkable spirit called Uskibetha, or Uskiba, which meant the water of life. Uski later became the word whiskey, as it is known today. Fast forward to the 18th century, the demand for Irish whiskey was great, and Ireland was home to 1,228 registered distilleries. Unfortunately, an act of parliament placing a tax on production passed in 1779, forcing many distilleries underground. By 1790, only 246 licensed distilleries remained in Ireland, and by 1821, that number had fallen to only 32. Thankfully, in 1823, authorities finally reformed the existing legislation, making distilling more attractive for prospective licensees. By 1827, the number of licensed distilleries in Ireland had risen to 82, and by 1835, to 93. By now, Irish whiskey had become the most popular spirit in the world. So how did the industry all but disappear in a matter of decades? At the turn of the 20th century, tremendous change came to Ireland. The Emerald Isle went through a war of independence, civil war, and then a trade war from the 1920s to 30s, which cut off whiskey exports to its biggest markets. Additionally, due to the nationwide prohibition on alcohol sales in the United States, exports to the U.S. were non-existent from 1920 to 1933. All of these factors greatly impacted the Irish whiskey industry and forced the closure of many distilleries. By the 1960s, there were only a small handful of brands and makers left. And in 1966, Jameson, Powers, and Cork Distilleries merged their operations to form Irish Distillers. By the 1970s, only two Irish whiskey producers remained, Irish Distillers and Bushmills out of Northern Ireland. In the 1970s and 80s, whiskey was losing market shares to clear spirits such as tequila, gin, and vodka pretty much all over the world. However, Irish whiskey began its remarkable, yet slow, resurgence in 1987 when the first new Irish whiskey distillery opened its doors in over a century. But things didn't really start picking up for Irish whiskey until the early 2000s. Today, there are more than 32 whiskey distilleries operating on the island, with several others in development and under construction, many of which will be introduced on this program. The first to be featured on the show is Bernard Walsh, founder of Walsh Whiskey and the creator of the Irishman and Writer's Tears Irish whiskeys. Up next, I speak with Mr. Walsh about his two brands and his personal whiskey journey. Stay with us. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to me. Good eve- Good afternoon to you, I believe. Good morning, America. Yes. Yeah. This is uh, Ireland calling. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, so today's on today's show, we have Bernard Walsh, and he is very fascinating to me. And so we called him up and said, please come and tell your story. So before I get into too much about Bernard, I'm going to let him tell us the story. And Bernard, first, can you tell us about your whiskey journey? Because I know that you and Rosemary, your wife, established the Walsh Whiskey Company back in 1999. But where did your journey actually begin? Like, where did your love for whiskey start? Well, okay, you're you're sort of bringing me back now. And before I chat, I'm actually just pouring myself a writer's tears here. Oh, nice. I'm just going to let her warm up while we while we sort of chat. So I, I like to have it sort of working away in the glass so it's ready. All right. Maybe well, then I'll do that. I'll just do a little bit of quality control first. And that'll be the copper pot, right? That's right. There's, there's copper pot. And we'll come back okay. to talk about that in a minute. Um, okay. So listen, you, you, you're, you're bringing me back there in 1999. Wow. It doesn't feel like it, but it's uh, it's 22 years of my life. And that's that's a, a fair stint of anybody's life. Um but in whiskey terms, you know, it's it's not it's not long, is it? Twenty two years. Right. But in whiskey terms, it ain't long. But um, I'm uh, as was my introduction to whiskey. If I if I really want to say it, I go back to my farming roots because um, I'm a, a, a farmer's son 
uh, one of nine from County Tipperary in, in, in Ireland. And um, yeah, no, and, you know, my parents did not drink, did not uh, drink whiskey, did not drink, uh, but my grandparents did. And my grandfather, uh, he, he, uh, he loved uh, his whiskey. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, he was blind for the latter part of his life and uh, every day um, my grandmother would take him for long walks and they'd get back to the house at about 11, 11 a.m. and they'd sit down uh, typically by the fire because, you know, often, often, often cold and wet here, nine months of the year anyway. And uh, yeah, uh, snuggle up and he always had uh, an Irish whiskey. And that was my, I'd get the lickings of a glass because I was only a chap then and I'd get the <laughs> lickings of a glass and it, it sort of intrigued me a little, a, a little bit. And that was my first, my first taste of whiskey. But Anyway, um, it was a, a you know a long journey from there till when I actually got involved in the business in uh, you know twenty two years ago, nineteen ninety nine. But in the interim, uh, like all uh, good Irish families, the eldest uh, stayed on the farm, did a wonderful job as a farmer, and the rest of us were educated and scattered to the four winds. Um, uh, eight of us scattered to the four winds, and I happened to get involved in software and technology, and had just a wonderful. Uh, you know, 15, 16 years in that industry and travel the world. And, but what always, I was always brought back to my agricultural roots because in my travels, and particularly I remember in France and in Italy, you know, my time, my days off would be spent in visiting vineyards. And I just loved uh, walking uh, through the, the, uh, the vines. Uh, I just loved uh, everything about that and how they, took the grape and just transformed it into this beautiful liquid called wine. I said, for me, you know, our, our grape is barley and our wine is whiskey. And I just loved the, how we transformed this into a beautiful aromatic liquid called whiskey. And that was a seed that was planted. And ultimately, like a lot of Irish, we do want to get back home. Um, and so myself and my wife, Rosemary, traveled back to Ireland and took the opportunity just to change a direction um, in our career. And we started out in a whiskey and liqueur business just because it was something that we were passionate about. Not, uh, you know, we didn't know too much about it at the time. It was very, 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 very interesting. But I was welcomed with open arms by the Irish whiskey industry, which amazingly was only three distillers. Uh, today, uh, we have, what, 38? And it, it, depending on what day of the week, you know, it's growing. Uh, but there were there was only three houses uh, on the island. You had uh, Middleton, which is owned by our distillers down south, and then up north we had Bush Mills, which again was owned by our distillers, and then you had uh, Cooley Distillery, and and uh, that was it. But incredibly, you know, nobody was knocking down the doors in '99 looking for Irish whiskey, and you know, as part of my, you know, I spent uh, you know a huge amount of time with the chaps at our distillers. Um, learned a hell of a lot, traveled to Scotland, learned from the Scots as well, up in Glen Grant and Dennis Malcolm, just wonderful people, just wonderful, wonderful people. Um, but to my dismay, when I went to, to market, if you like, to talk to people, to talk to people in the bars and, and so forth, nobody was looking for another Irish whiskey. They said, we have one. It's there. <laughs> you know, that was it. Ridiculous. And um, so, you know, I was... You know, I had to sort of you know, bite my lip and then say, OK, well, I'm going to do this anyway. <laughs> so I ignored all the great advice I got and uh, sort of entered entered the gap in the market where there was no gap. <laughs> and well, there uh, was a gap. They just didn't want to they didn't want to say there was a gap, but there was a gap. But it was but ig let's say ignorance or my lack of maybe uh know how at the time was great because it just kept me going. And what you need in any business is resilience and what you need in the whiskey business is extreme resilience it's a right. long-term project and that's what i love it's like farming you're looking down you know years ahead you're always you know you're not looking over your shoulder you're not looking at well next year or we, we we're always looking long term so i love that um so yeah it it, it very very, very sl simply started there i was also i suppose um a couple of things were going on in my head at the time. What was happening in the US with bourbon in the early 2000s, and I was really excited about that. Um, and also, I suppose I was enviable of what the Scots had done with, especially single malt, and how they um, you know, had broadened out the Scot Scottish offering 
and moved, you know, okay, yes, Scottish blend, very popular, but everything that happened within that malt category, uh, for whether it's the wood, they were at the cast finishes and so forth, there was just so much excitement around that. And none of that was happening in the Irish because there was no no competition, no need to do it. It was, a, right. you know, and, and that's understandable and that's fine. So very much we saw it as uh, our job to really try and get Irish whiskey back to where it was 100 and 150 years ago. And the diversity and the taste profile of Irish whiskey back then was, you know, so much different. And right. So it was a great, you know, we, we set ourselves the challenge of broadening out the taste profile of Irish whiskey. And, you know, now we're, you know, we're one of many of an army of uh, people in the Irish whiskey industry trying to do that. Um, we, you know, we, we were lucky. We were one of the early folk there, some of the pioneers, and we're right in the middle of a, an Irish whiskey renaissance as we speak. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the Irishman really quick. I know that's not what we're here to talk about, but is that what you started your your profiles with? Yeah, listen, um, I'm here to always talk about my babies, and I have two of them. I've got <laughs> the Irishman and Rider's Tears, and uh, just so that we don't miss out. So this is the Irishman. Um, the Irishman focuses uh, mainly on the, the malt side of the house, the single malt side of the house, the malt side, and it's very traditional look and feel. And I, mm -hmm. I had two things pulling at me in, 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 in if you like, in, the, in my uh, whiskey quest. So one was you know, being true to, um, I suppose, uh, the traditions and being very traditionalist. And that's what the Irishman represents to me. Of course, on the other side, there's the rebel in me. And, you know, uh, <laughs> in the Irish heads, there's always the yin and yang. Well, the rebel exactly. in me always wanted to just do something very, very different. And that's what Writer's Tears was. So if I, like, here we go. So let's get a wee bottle out here. Oh, I've, I've also been uh, nipping at my bottle here. Uh, so even in, in look, the name, everything about it, it was left of center from what was an offer uh, from Irish, from the Irish whiskey category. And if you, you know, if you look at the, the, the bottle, even you'll see the influence, the bourbon influence. I love the edginess of what was happening with bourbon in the early 2000s. And that's what we've tried to bring to Writer's Tears. So the Irishman, did you come up with that name? for traditional reasons i mean how did that come to be yeah it's it's uh again like everything in 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 ireland history is never too far away um whether it comes to irish whiskey uh but with with the name as well um i suppose i was i was moved um by uh a great irish uh, patriot wolf tone who back in 1798 talked about uh, an Ireland uh, where he would not be known as uh, a Catholic nor a, a dissenter, but just an Irishman. And you know we have you know many many we've had many troubles in this isle uh, over the hundreds of years. And um, yeah, I, I really I look forward to the day when you know we're just Irish we're Irish men Irish people. Um, no matter what your color creed is, um, you know we're all we're we're all together, and that's the beautiful thing about Irish whiskey. Uh, it is, and uh, the whole island, north, south, on the island, is a category that's defined uh, within the island. So we have a geographical indication here in Europe for Irish whiskey, similar to the Scottish and Champagne and cognac, and it's not. North, or there's, it's not just the Republic of Ireland; it is the whole island. Uh, so we're united in whiskey. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, tell me, how did Writer's Tears come about? And and give us a little background too on how you chose the name for this one. Ah, we'll be here a while. <laughs> 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 I, I better have, uh, yeah, wet the lips. Hmm. So, um, ah, delicious. many of your 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 listeners and viewers. Uh, will will be familiar with the Irish whiskey story and the history around it, and how you know a uh, hundred, two hundred years ago, Irish whiskey was quite big. In fact, it was a golden era for for Irish whiskey. And um, I'll come back to that history, uh, that whiskey piece, in a minute. But also for Irish liturgy, uh, the writing, the the the, the great geniuses of the time. We're out of Ireland. We're out of Dublin. We're out of the west of Ireland from your country, Kerry. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, um, this, this, it was an incredible 
boom in literature. Um, so you have the likes of James Joyce, Oscar Wilde, George Bernard Shaw, uh, the list goes on. Um, even pre that, Jonathan Swift, uh, um, you know, Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula, all these amazing guys uh, emanating out of Ireland and just, uh, uh, it, it was a golden era for Irish writing. And if you have been to Dublin, you will see occasionally there'll be some of the old bars who'll have a plaque outside or inside uh, saying, you know, this is where uh, you, this is where Behan used to drink, this is where James Joyce would have a drop, etc. And a story is told that, you know, what well, they'd go there to observe life so whether they sat inside and looked looked out or sat inside looking at the uh the clientele but they they sat there observing life and drinking uh their whiskey whiskey was a you know very popular back in the 1800s and uh the story is told that they could be there for an hour a day a week nobody knew how long they were there for observing life but what they did know is that when they cried their tears were of whiskey so mm. that, so we adapted that uh, lovely um, sort of story of uh, the scribe, if you like, and how it just coincided with the golden era of Irish whiskey as well. That's awesome. That's really awesome. So tell me, um, what is Writer's Tears' involvement with the um, the film project about James Joyce? Ah, a, a, a couple of things. Um, we have... We've always had an, like, you know, there's personally and then there's work, but on both fronts, I've always had an int interest in, in our great writers. And I got an opportunity to help out um, a, a bunch of friends uh, who operated and ran Sweeney's Pharmacy, or it was a chemist. And this was a, a famous chemist in Dublin. It's in uh, Lincoln Place, just at the back of end of uh, Trinity College. Uh, in Dublin, and this uh, Sweeney's chemist was in operation uh, during Joyce's time, and he incorporated this into his uh, book Ulysses. Mm -hmm. And this Mr. Bloom, uh, who, who spends one day wandering through Dublin, uh, the, is Ulysses, this magnificent, possibly the greatest novel of the twentieth century. It's about one guy. He's he, his day traveling around Dublin and he calls into Sweeney's and it's a, it, it plays a part in, in Ulysses. But unfortunately, the chemist has, I think it was 2009, ceased to exist, you know, end of the line, etc. cetera. Um, and a number of Joy Joycean enthusiasts came together and said, Let, listen, we'll keep the doors open. And instead of, you know, us dispensing tinctures of uh, ointments and so forth, we'll actually, you know, we'll, we'll make it a bookstore as well, a secondhand bookstore. Nice. Um, and, that, and that all went, and, that, and this was really important. You know, this is an amazing piece of history that could have been lost uh, and has been saved by these enthusiasts who only had, the, you know, the shillings the, the, in, in the dollars in their pocket to keep the doors open. Unfortunately, the land, you know, it's in a very, uh, you know, property-wise, you know, uh, a you know, prestigious part of Dublin, and the rent was just going up and up and up, and uh, the um, uh, Sweeney's found themselves that, they could no longer pay the rent. Uh -huh. So we took the opportunity, you know, to come in and help them to keep the doors open by paying uh, some of the rent for them. So that was well, that's very nice. my first sort of connection with the Joycean story. And then um, we, I hear about this documentary being made about Ulysses, which next year, 2022 uh, will be the 100th anniversary of Ulysses. Yeah. So I hear uh, about the story. Of, well, there's a documentary we made, but not about necessarily about Joyce, or not necessarily about some of the, the amazing venues around Dublin. But by it's about four women, and these are the four women who, uh, without them, Ulysses would not have seen the, the light of day. Um, and I just love this. I've got four daughters, so there's a yeah. You know, just I would love my four daughters to know about this, you know. And right. you know, these women need to be celebrated. These four women, you know, the fortitude of these women, you know, was incredible because the you know this book was banned in the U.S. of A. Yeah, they, you know, um, the I think it's the first two thousand. Uh, the first edition there was two thousand uh, produced in in England, uh, of which five hundred made their way to North America into US, and I, I believe most of the five hundred were burnt. 
Mm-hmm. So <laughs> these they were strange times. Yeah. So anyway, listen, we're lucky. We are really lucky and privileged that Writers Tears can actually lend a hand. We want to shine a light on this film. We want to make sure that it, uh, the story is told. So yeah, we, that's awesome. We're really excited. Uh, and the Kickstarter is that still happening right now? Is that a current, or are they? Did they reach their goal? Are they ready to go? They they have reached a goal, so um, we got we we got that done and dusted. So uh, yeah, it's looking you know it, it's looking really really promising. Awesome, that's very cool. I, I when I was looking at that story, I thought, oh, this is amazing because I always I always like to find out about women in whiskey history and women in in every kind of history because I always feel like behind every good man is a good woman doing yes. something to promote the man to you know yeah, yeah. Well, be as great in, as they turn out to be. Case, in Joyce's case, that's so true. In my case, that's so true because my wife Rosemary, you know, uh, it was together with her we we started this business, and she's kept me on the straight and narrow since then. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about this first expression that we've been sipping on. This is the copper pot. Oh, I got to refill. Is... I got to oh. refill. Hold on. <laughs> and and what was the first expression of Writer's Tears? And how many? How long did it take before you had multiple expressions? Right. Before I answer, I really have to. That's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Understandable. It's so delicious. I love this part of the job. I love mm-hmm. it. Um, Ditto. <laughs> so with all our whiskies, again, I lean on history a lot. Um, and with Writer's Tears in particular. So for me, the, the, the embers for, for uh, this great whiskey came from or research into Irish whiskey in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could even say maybe late 1700s. But in the 17 and 1800s, 1800 in particular, two styles of whiskey dominated here in Ireland, pot still Irish whiskey and malt whiskey. So, um, and I don't know if we if we, if we have time to go into the, the, the pot still story, but um, sure. it's something that's you know quite unique to Irish whiskey. Um, in, in Scotland, you know, you've got your single malt and you've got your grain whiskey and then your, your blends of those. Um, in Ireland, we have one extra style called single pot still whiskey, um, which really was created uh, out of necessity, if you like. Um, there were taxes brought in in the 1700s uh, on Irish whiskey. Um, let, me, and, let me guess, by the British. Well, so, well our, friend, <laughs> let's go, our friends across the pond, and, <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was a malt whiskey tax. Um, ultimately, it was a tax that was put on the malting barley because, of course, with whiskey, you can divert one pipe in a wall to that tank and another one to that barrel and you can cut your tax bill that way but the authorities are wise to that so ultimately they said i don't care uh, how much whiskey you make it's we're we're, we're, we're taxing them it's the ba- barley which is malted and a tonnage of barley comes in um and uh, so forth so that was that was the tax so to avoid the tax or to reduce their tax bill so very efficient tax planning um, the Irish uh, distillers started to introduce and change the mash bill. So instead of using all malted barley, bringing in other cereals, most importantly, unmalted barley into the mash bill. So that had a wow effect on the on the whiskey. So mm-hmm. this developed into uh, whiskey that the Irish grew to love and adopt to be you know, the ultimate in Irish whiskey, which was uh, a very spicy creamy full-bodied whiskey and this was uh, you know adopted in ireland it was adopted in north america in the us as you know this is the go-to whiskey it was a wow whiskey and through the 1800s pot still and malt whiskies were were distilled the the grain whiskies so let's say distilled from a column still invented by an irish man or i shouldn't say invented by an irish patented by an irish man a mr coffee uh the, the, the grain whiskies were not to the liking of the Irish in general and very much shunned. And everything that originated from the pot was bellissimo. So the, the pot and malt combination became known as a champagne blend of Irish whiskey. And that's what spurred me. Wow. Taking pot and malt, two purest ingredients, uh, marrying them together and you are now going to taste the, the end result. I, it, it was, I remember at the time, I said, surely 
when we were doing this, that Irish whiskey, they they have there are other brands, other blends, other uh, out there doing this. But no, uh, this was a first for Irish whiskey in living memory. And I've been around more than fifty years, so uh, um, you know. Th- so this was a style that had sort of died out, and uh, we got a great, you know, we got the opportunity to, to, to bring it back, and I just love this. I do. That's what I. One of the things I do love about uh, about Copper Pot uh, whiskeys is, is um, okay. So Irish whiskeys and space side scotches are my favorite whiskeys. And then second to that, if you go to America, I'm into <clears throat> rye. So what I like about the copper pot is it has a little bit of a bite like the rye. So I feel like the copper pots, Irish whiskeys always are like the combination between kind of a, a single malt scotch and the heat of the rye, which makes it. So that's why I like it so much. Yeah. It's so good. Well, I, I, I love the, uh, I love that spicy note, that rye, that rye note that you're picking out. I really yeah. that, and it's it's up front, yep. but then give it you know ten seconds, and then you've got this lovely malt palate, just beautiful floral, and there's, there is no burn. I've got that lovely spice up front, but no burn. This right, is just be- you know, well balanced, be- yeah, you know, really, really nice. So was the, the this this first expression here that the triple distilled uh, copper pot was that the first um, expression that you guys made for Writer's Tears? It was it was the first expression we made for Riders Tears, and um, uh, you know we, I suppose, I learned a lot in the process because you know it being being our first, so you know many you know we we had many casks uh, tucked away, experiments and things like that, and not all went to plan because there was nobody to tell us there was you know nobody had done this before. Um, there was no whiskey association, um, which there is now. Uh, right. Well, this was all new ground. So you know, we 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 learned very quickly, and we we had to adapt and change or whatever. And this brought me to uh, our next project, which was double oak. So Riders Tears double oak, and I think we are going to taste that. Yeah, you've got look. look at that. I'm gonna I'm gonna brag now because I got a full bottle. Yeah. Ah, well, I had a full bottle. I don't know what happened to it. You've got you've got, <laughs> well, you've got a, a le- leakage problem there. I think uh, I know. The next are going to be really curious. Somehow it's been leaking right into my stomach. I don't know what's. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. So this is a Riders Tears Double Oak. So Riders Tears Double Oak was born out of uh, one of our experiments that just really. I was just so thrilled about. Um, I have a friend in France. His family are in the cognac business, um, the Lagarde family. And I just love what they do. It's a small artisan cognac house, uh, Do Exo, D E A U. Do Exo Cognac uh, is their. Uh, they're big brand, but they're small. And mm-hmm. uh, but it's a one, it's a wonderful cognac. I, lo- I, I I love everything about it. And I I approached them, said, "Listen, could you, you know, because they don't typically like to in cognac generally uh, let let casks out, especially when it's associated with um, a cognac house. You right. might you get generic barrels, etc. But the they were delighted to do this collab. It was a collaboration, and uh, so the, the the casks came to Ireland. Uh, there were two casks. That's all. <laughs> uh, wow. We we uh, Riders Tears rested in there for about eighteen months wow. um, as a finish, and we we tasted all the way along. And you know, it's very unusual for me to to leave something in, in that long for a for a cask. Yeah, that's a long for a finish. You don't yeah. want it overpowered. You don't want to lose. Uh, the character of the originating whiskey, or, or well, I definitely don't because I we love Riders Tears and uh, its personality. So here, it just it was wonderful the the cognac cask uh, combination, and I must say, Riders Tears uh, that we tasted Copper Pot earlier on is all matured in bourbon barrel. So again, okay. um, that would be a nice connection for you, back to you, Kerry, and your your, right. your, your love for bourbon. <clears throat> particular rye um but here we have cognac cask you know cognac casks are light you know they're um there's oak casks lightly toasted 
not charred. So it's a, a whole a whole different um, aspect and bringing a whole new flavor profile to the whiskey. Right. So that project went so well. We, we said, listen, can we make this a permanent addition um, and, and Ryder's Tears expression? So that's Ryder's Tears Double Oak. Uh, we and have, so, the, so the cognac folks said, okay, fine. And now you're getting more yeah. than two barrels, I hope. We, we are, we are, listen, we, it, it's, uh, every year it's getting bigger and we're laying down more casks and that, that's the, I suppose the perennial channel challenge for, uh, the, the, the whiskey makers, um, uh, is to, you know, how much to, to lay down and, you know, well, you'll have say me with my, if I put my sales hat on saying, listen, we're going to sell tons of this and, uh, the, uh, the poor guy down in the warehouse uh, with the barrels <laughs> and cows saying, <laughs> you know, so we have to, there's, there's a balancing act there. Right. Uh, but Rider's Tears Double Oak has been a real, you know, just eye opener for me to see um, how we can take Rider's Tears Copper Pot, which is an expression I absolutely love, and now introduced to Cognac Cask and totally change it. And I don't know, Kerry, if you've had a, a chance to, Hello. Yeah, I'm I'm having some of that right now. It's delicious. I can I can definitely taste um you know the copper pot in it, but the 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 double oak does definitely give it a, a new more there's a, you know that um it's a it's a big that creamy note pop. that you get you know that creamy note you get in, in, in a cognac. I can I can feel that that in Potsdam as well we talk about a creamy note. Mm -hmm. And they really work well together. Also, that um, that gingery or spicy note that you get from a, a, a cognac, especially in the, those charred casks or the um, lightly toasted casks, um, yeah, that's there's a lovely there's a lovely balance there. Yeah, for sure. Now, <clears throat> is the copper pot expression the base for all of your whiskies or just some of the whiskies? For for a lot of them, not all of them. Okay. Um, so you know that's um, that's that's our go to. Um, and for the whiskies we're talking about today, it's based on our Rider's Tears Copper Pot, which is that pot malt. And it's what we've been known for. Uh, we were the first to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, pr proudly, proudly, uh, you know, retaining that title, if you like. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Oh, so good. Um, I, I, I've got to add, Larry, <clears throat> uh, let me see that. You may not see that there, but it's 46, 46 percent or oh yeah, uh, yep. So it's uh, nine, oh, so 92, yeah, it goes ninety two proof. Yeah, so it's a little hotter than the than the copper pot. The copper pot's so only forty. A little bit more oomph. So on on registered copper pot, yeah, it's at forty. Yeah, and I was I was also noticing the label. Um, let me get this up here. The label uh, up here is this is this your signature? That's my signature, Kerry. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's listen. There's a there's a, some nice little detail uh, on the on the neck of the bottle. We've got some of the technical detail, the time system, I love it. the grain type used, the barrels used. Um, on the main label, in blind deboss, we have an extract from James Joyce's portrait of an artist as a young man. Oh, um, that's great. So yeah, it was lovely to be able to get out and then, you know, we've. Some lovely. I love this little with a WT cutout on the label. Yeah. yeah, it looks like typewriter. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I I actually my first uh, experience with this whiskey, well, actually this whiskey <laughs> was uh, <laughs> about two years ago, and I still have the bottle because there was a point where I was making lamps out of bottles. Um, I was trying to start a, a little side business, but then. I had too many bottles and too many lamp pieces. Um, nice. But anyway, I still have a bottle. A friend of mine is making a, a bar in her backyard, and she's going to call it Storybrook. And it's a big, huge shed. And the idea is to put, it's basically going to look like a library. And so I said, oh, well, we have to get, we have to make a lamp for your bar made out of the writer's tear bottle. And it is not the same label. It is, it is a little bit different. It doesn't have the little WT. So when I went out, uh, you know, this year to get more, I was like, oh, wow, they've changed up the label. It looks really nice. It's very snazzy. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So. No, thank, yeah. We, um, so 
I suppose if we go back to uh, the founding of Rider's Tears and, and that it, the 1800s and uh, that Victorian timeline, we wanted to upgrade the bottle to be more Victorian in, in look and feel. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we have with the, the type font and uh, going back to cork, because I think your original one, Kerry, I think capsule, what about, yeah. Tin, mm -hmm. tin. Yep. Um, uh, also, I love this. We have a, a glass embellishment on the uh, yes. shoulder here, which is a, a tear. tear. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So. I, I kind of want to remake the lamp now with the new bottle, but yeah. having the old bottle is also vintage. So that's cool. It's vintage. Right. It's a collector's yeah. item. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I'll definitely buy a bottle of you. You make it into a lamp. I'll buy it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I'm your I'll, I'll send you. Which nothing. one do you want? I've got copper pot. I've got uh, double oak. I have the cast strength. And out of Whichever my own collection. Which one you finish first? Which one you finish first? <laughs> hmm. Which will I finish first? Um, so the next one we have is the cast strength. And then um, I had my own collection uh the marsala i went to a wow. tasting not too long ago and i fell in love with this and i was able to find it so uh i, I grabbed a bottle while i could but let's talk about the cast strength yes okay now it's it's interesting you have the cast strength uh, okay it comes in a, a yes box. gorgeous a gorgeous box yes yeah with the whole Yep. yep, the wood slidey. Yep, slidey. This thing. this will be going on my shelf in my. I have a. Yeah. I have nice, my whole. Actually, a nice bit of furniture for the uh, the, the the bookshop or the library. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have uh, in my kitchen, the entire top of all of the cabinets is filled with drunken bottles, and it's lit up, and pe and it keeps getting bigger, and people go, "Have you drank all of those?" And I'm like. I've tasted something out of every bottle. Some bottles I got from going to tastings and I took the empties home, but a good portion of them I drank most of it. You know, not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yes, the cast strength. Here it is, um, and that's the 2020 vintage that's in the US at the moment. Yes. Uh, of which there are only 1,500 bottles made it to the US. So you wow. did well, Carrie, to get one bottle? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let me get my glass. Oh, and I have bottle number 0384 of 1500, it says. Mm -hmm. And I've then it says strength 54.5%. I've got bottle 007. No, oh, that's awesome. No. Do you really? No. <laughs> that would be great. You should have taken that. Yeah, you should get every 007 bottle. You should take yeah. all of them and have a collection. <laughs> um, so... Oh, what's you chapter know, four mean? It says chapter so four at the each top. Expre each expression we give different chapter numbers to. That's okay. awesome. So um, now this is, you know, both of us have been drinking whiskey for, for a while, decades, and enjoying whiskey. And, yep. you know, I, I again, when I went to Scotland, I, I was just amazed at the breadth and depth of, of their offering. And one thing that you know I really enjoyed was tasting cast strength or high strength whiskey, you know, as almost like the distiller wants you to taste it before you maybe dilute it down. And um, yeah, I really like that concept, that idea. I love the taste, um, and I was just amazed that in Ireland there was none, zero, uh, zero cast strength whiskeys on offer, commercial offerings anyway. Uh, yeah. in my lifetime and again you know how old i am so it's you know <laughs> <laughs> you're barely 50 that's what you said barely 50 bar barely 50 you know there's a five and there's, there's something else in there but <laughs> um but in my lifetime you know no cast strand or high strand irish whiskey is available on offer so this is part did they of did they even have them offered as like distillery tastings or anything nope that's nope. crazy but why would you when you know it's only a small club at the, back in 1999 True. and before that, True. a very small club, um, there was you know no real competition to, to have to diversify up beyond that. So you, you know I can tell you commercially, I make a lot more money selling at 40% ABV than uh, at 50 or above right. that. So right. you know it's commercially you know it's a, it, it was a wise thing. But in fairness to the 
the whiskey companies that went before us in the 1980s and 1990s, you know, they did save Irish whiskey from going out of business. They, uh, you know, they've done a wonderful job, you know, keep, keeping keeping it together, keeping us in business, and allowing myself and many many more people uh, to get involved in Irish whiskey. Right. Absolutely. But this was an opportunity to diversify out the the taste profile of Irish whiskey. Let's introduce some high strength, cast strength whiskey. So here you go. This is the first for Irish whiskey. Um, and every year we'll take some exceptional casks and we do, we do it both for US and the rest of the, rest of the world, Europe. Um, so on, on average, we'll have three to 4,000 with mo most of them ending up in Europe, but of that 1,500 will end up in the, in the US. Um, I just love this. It's delicious. And what I like about it is it, it has a big pop of flavor, but the finish does not burn. So even though it's it's hot going in, it's it's cool going down. <laughs> You've taken the words right out of my mouth. This I, they, There's beautiful heat. I, I, I just love the warmth, mm -hmm. but no burn. And then right. give it 10 seconds, 20 seconds. I, I've got just a, this beautiful creamy palate. Yep. There's waves of different flavors here. Yeah, this is definitely a sipper that you'd want to. In fact, I was sipping on this last night um, because it kind of forces you to drink slow. Because yeah. you, if you don't drink it slow, then you miss all the after finish flavors. I feel if I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it that. The after finish flavors. The after finish. Yeah, I like that. These are the after finish flavors. Now I'm just going to try a drop of water because it's often interesting. Maybe that was too, I'll put another droppy in there. There we go. Um, it's always interesting, you know, just to add a drop, no more. Yeah, I did, uh, last night I did, well, I did three of these. So I did a neat, I did a drop of water, and then I, I've i just got this apparatus that makes clear see-through ice. So I put that in there. You couldn't even see the ice cube in here, but it was a small one. So, um, and because it was the shape that it was in, it, it, it um, melted slowly. So for the first, you know, five minutes, it was opening up all the flavors and yet cooling down. It was fantastic. It was a... It was a great experience last night. Let me just yeah. say. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, I'm really enjoying this. I've just put uh, two drops of water in. Um, it really has. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. I do. So I do love ex experimenting. Kerry uh, is a privilege that we have, and you know, be, right. And this is this is the reward we get, you know. And if you look in my office, I don't advise you do, but there's bottles everywhere, and, and it's. <laughs> They're stacked and there's little tinctures and all sorts. Um, but getting to taste and try things and, uh, and you know, we're not, we can't say, you know, we're always right, but we have a particular taste profile that we right. like and then and we, we, we follow our hearts in that way. And I love, and I don't know if that's because I'm of Irish descent or if just because you've nailed it on the head for the whole world, but I absolutely love every expression I've ever tasted from you guys. Um, I did a tasting, I don't know, like a month ago. And I think we had like five or six different expressions and um, I couldn't afford to buy all of them. But my favorite of that was the Marsala cask. So I did go out and buy a bottle. So I would love to uh, to talk about that one here in a second. But okay. before we do, can yeah. you tell me how many expressions total you guys make, whether they make it to the U.S. or not? Um, well, I... Each year, I will have somewhere between 14 and 16 expressions on offer. Wow. But our core, so the core for Rider's Tears will be uh, Rider's Tears Copper Pot you've just tasted, Rider's Tears Double Oak, Rider's mm -hmm. Tears Cask, and there's one other core. So we have four in the core, and the other one is Rider's Tears Redhead. Ah. Katja. Yeah, Redhead. I don't yeah. think I've had the Redhead. Oh, this is. But a, that makes sense, being Irish, a redhead. Yeah, yeah I'm. I'm. I'm, sur I'm just surprised, Carrie. You have not had the redhead. Here we go. And is so, that offered in the U.S.? Because if it is, I'm going to have to go find it. It is uh, extremely limited. You will find it, I'm sure, or we will make sure we help you find it. Um, Great. The writer's tears redhead. 
Uh, and while it's core, it only we we only have one batch that we get to the U.S. every year. So that you know, it's quite, unfortunately, it's limited in that sense. Right now, on top of that, um, we do a lot of experimentation, um, a lot of uh, and. The great thing about Irish whiskey is, you know, you don't have to just use oak. You can use other woods. Uh, right. But even within oak, you know, again, prior to 1999, there was very little wood experimentation. So we've we, we've tried a hell of a lot. And the ones that work, you get the taste. Um, so just to give you an idea, like uh, last year, seaweed IPA cask finish. Right, a seaweed. Seaweed? Oak. So if you think Ooh. about um, uh, was it. Was it salty? It was. It had, there was a little, a little, you know, when you uh, you taste maybe a light salted caramel. Yeah, I was going to say maybe little, that would be good with one of those uh, salted caramel chocolate. Yeah, there was a little of that coming through, but it was a, a sea, so it was a beer, an IPA beer, uh, mm -hmm. and in the mash for the beer was seaweed, and the seaweed was harvested down here in Kerry, uh, in, um, in on the Dingle Peninsula. I'm going to say that's the best county. I've never been there, but it's the best county because it's spelled correctly. <laughs> it's the only county for you. Um, <laughs> but the the seaweed was harvested locally in County Kerry on the Dingle Peninsula, and that was used uh, in the mash bill for the beer. Uh, the mm -hmm. beer. Uh, matured in the uh, in our barrels in uh, oak casks and then we they enjoy the beer we took the casks and uh, we experimented with our whiskies in the casks and it was stunning it was uh, anything with beer is, is is difficult to do on a, on a major on a, on a major scale we find out if, if you really want that stunning note uh, you you know there's uh, there's uh, a lot of work we did we did work with um uh, a coffee stout, uh, so a stout beer, coffee stout it's called, and that was absolutely gorgeous. But God, did, was... you, did you use the coffee still for the coffee stout? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, so again, it was a, it was a, a cask. Um, so in 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 the ma in the mash bill for the stout, uh, there was a cold brew coffee used in that. Uh, oh, lovely! It, it was it was it was phenomenal. Um, so we do all of these. Uh, now, is that a, is that available anywhere currently, whether it's here or there or at an airport specialty um, shop? Or? It's really with collectors. So if you, yeah, if it, now that one was done on the Irishman brand. So the Irishman Coffee Stout, mm -hmm. if you Google that, you'll find it with some collectors. Um, but, uh, you know, it was it was only a, a, a single cask. So, uh, but okay. it's, you know, I, I know I've got people calling me and asking for it, but they do find at auction sometimes. Oh, wow. Yeah. I asked because I, I have a twin sister and she is to coffee as I am to whiskey. And she um, just bought a, um, a boutique coffee shop or coffee, not shop, coffee company um, at the end of last year. And she roasts her own beans and she and she has it's direct from the farmer. So I keep trying to win her over with whiskey, but if it doesn't have coffee involved, okay. she won't even taste Here's it. Your in. Here's your in, right? Listen to so there's an amazing coffee house in Dingle on the Dingle Peninsula in the little village of Dingle, D I N G L E, and the co the the coffee house is called Bean B E A N Bean to Dingle. Uh, Google it. They make amazing. They roast their own coffee. It's amazing, and they are. That's where the idea originated from. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's very awesome. So, um, other other casks that we've experimented that have, have have sort of moved from experimental into mainstream, as in made available to here in Europe and in the US, uh, would be the Marsala Rogers Marsala cask that mm -hmm. we're we'll talking talk about in a second because you have you have one in your ca in your stash there, uh, yep. and another one which I really love. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Here we go. Bingo. This one, you uh, you should be able to get some of this in. So this is the Japanese cast finish, the Mizunara oak. Okay. Oh yes, I um, had the Mizunara oak. That is you, delicious. You, you as a rye lover will love this because it's spicy. I did. Oak, this is just. Beautiful. Yeah, I did. I did try that in the tasting. It was fantastic. I was debating. Actually, I think the reason I ended up buying the Marsala and not that one was because they didn't have that one in stock. So I got the Marsala, but both yeah. of them were my favorite too from that, from that tasting. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. So from the U S for writers tears, I think, yeah, they're the two additional ones that made it. So the Japanese and the Marsala. Okay. 
Uh, now, back to business. Uh, the This is the Mar uh, Marsala you were talking well, about. Well, wait, before we go to that, can you tell me a little bit more about the redhead? Because ah. I'm intrigued with okay. redhead. So, um, so you asked earlier on, you know, if uh, all our expressions were the pot malt uh, combination, the marriage, right. and I uh, said so not all. And redhead's in a, a, a classic example. This is a sherried malt. So, uh, and it is malt. red. I can see it's got yeah, red tones. It's matured great. in in oloroso sh uh, sherry buds for its entirety. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful dram, and I I am envious of the Scots and what they've done with the single malt category and. They've thrown the gauntlet down and we, the Irish, have now got to take that up and show them that, well, you know, we used to make amazing single malt and malt whiskies and watch out, we're coming for you. <laughs> there you go. Well, because, you know, you guys started it all and then they, they, you know, went on and, you know, we had stupid prohibition, which did not help your, your whiskey situation. No, uh, no. So... Yeah. The Scots were the only ones to come out the right side of the prohibition, huh? Right, <laughs> right. All right, let's get some Marsala here. Right. Okay. And I, my father, every time we went out to dinner growing up, he, everywhere we went, he, and this is what I think was so funny. He, he grew up in a household where they made their steaks well done. And I don't know if that's because my grandmother was afraid that they were going to get sick or what, but the whole rest of the family would order their steaks medium rare and my dad would get well done. So anytime there was chicken on the, on the menu, he would take a chicken. I'm like, who wants chicken over a steak? And then anytime there was chicken marsala, which that I get because the chicken marsala was always great, but there was this one restaurant we would always go to and he would always get the chicken marsala. So as soon as I saw this, uh, the marsala cask, I said, oh, well, I'm going to have to have that with the chicken marsala and, and cheers to my father. So Yes, here, here's the dad. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is so lovely. I, do, <sighs> this is, I love the balance on this. Yes. Now, it's very, so the marsala. It's light, but it's, but it's mm. hearty at the same time. Yeah. There's a, the marsala um, came, the cask came from the Florio Winery in Sicily. And it's just a, it's a wonderful winery. If you're ever down in Sicily, you know, get in and have a look. Um, they, they've, they've got it open to visitors and uh, do, do the tasting there. It's just, it's just great. So again, I was fortunate, just like I was in, in Cognac and then working with uh, uh, good people to get hold of some amazing casks. So we managed to get some casks out of the Florio Winery and we've used them uh, to really layer on a whole new uh, Mediterranean feel to Rider's Tears. It's it's I, it, it's bringing it in a whole new direction for me. It's fantastic. So how many uh, different experiments do you have planned for this next year? I, I try to bring to the US every year, if I as a minimum, two new expressions uh, of Rider's Tears uh, and two for the Irishman as well. So that's the aim. Doesn't always work out, but that's what I'm trying. Okay. And, and the facility that you, the distillery, do you have, are both of them made out of the same place or do you have two different locations? No, no. No, all, so when we started out in back in 1999, we as we were really lucky to get to spend time with Irish distillers and down to our wonderful distillery, um, and you know I learned a lot there. Um, we ended up uh, sourcing just amazing distillate out of that distillery, and that formed that's been the bedrock of Friders Tears since day one. And it, it is just beautiful distillate. And now it's about how I can layer on just different taste profiles, just bring it to a, a new level, how I can uh, put my DNA, my stamp on it and broaden out that taste profile for Irish whiskey we spoke about. So that's been my project ever since. That's awesome. And uh, my last, well, not my last question, but one of my last questions. Um, now, I know you started... Uh, in 1999, the company with your wife, and what role does she 
play today? Is she still a key factor in everything? She is, absolutely. Uh, Rosemary is uh, involved in the business uh, for the last 22 years as well. A little bit camera shy, so I get pushed out here to, <laughs> to, to, to speak to you. But yeah, Rosemary is very much involved um, in the um, branding side of the business, uh, has also, um, I suppose, you know, great uh, feel for the taste, the palate. So when it comes to new expressions, she's the first port of call to discuss and ask. And, and uh, yeah, she, you know, she, she's always there, always there guiding us. And did she have anything to do with the design of the labels? Ah, um, yes, because, uh, you know, no, la no label or design was, was sort of passed unless I got Rosemary's sort of uh, nod. Uh, we actually worked with a company in London called Stranger and Stranger. They are in, again, you know, look them up, a fantastic firm. They've got an operation in New York and San Francisco, I believe now. Um, mm -hmm. So just, just great people, great designers, everything. When we started out in 99, Rosemary and myself, and I would say Rosemary more than me, designed everything. You know, we did it. And then we went to a local house, a local design house, a graphic house, and then they would tweak it and get it on, get it into the right shape and away we go. So you know, we were happy in, in our ignorance, you know, this is great, the, you know, it was, it was fine. But um, I think we, we, we learned that, you know, uh, in order to compete at the top table, we had to up our game. And that mm -hmm. was then, okay, well, we can't be great at everything. So let's work with a really good design firm. And uh, we for, for the Writers Cheers uh, label, we worked with um, Stranger Stranger, and they've done a wonderful job. Um, but yeah, everything down to the color. So you'll see even on the Marsala, now that surely that tells you that a, a lady picked that color. Oh, see, mine looks different than yours. Oh yeah. To... Well, when you get onto, when you get onto the, 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 the new look, yeah. Oh, my bottle is 165 of 888. Now, I should save this for my sister because her favorite number is eight. So any number of eights together, yeah. that that so that maybe she'll like this. We've, yeah. we've, we've got a whole team of uh, ladies here, uh, more than guys. Uh, so, you know, from day, you know, other than Rosemary and myself in the business, our first employee was Geraldine. Uh, we've, you know, uh, Geraldine's uh, been right there with us and she's at the production end of the business. We have Claire, Claire Minock, who's our, our marketing manager. And Claire is a whiz, a, just, just a great, a great, very creative person. And cr she's, she's dragged me along into a whole new direction. And, uh, you know, she, Claire's a few years younger than me. <laughs> so she's a lot more energy and, and uh, yeah, a lot, uh, you know, it's, it's been brilliant just uh, getting very creative people into our business. That's awesome. And what, uh, what do you, what are your current goals for the future with this brand and with the Irishman and, and are you thinking about making a third brand? Okay. To come out? Good question. Um, the last one first then, and uh, I'm not thinking about making a third brand. I've got two, I've got two amazing brands that will allow Both, me yes. to cover. So I, this is the platform and I've got so much work I, I want to do and these brands will allow me to do that. Yeah. Uh, the Irishman is, so we've given Writers Tears after 10 years, we gave it a makeover. Now, if I was working with one of the big drinks firms, I'd be doing probably this every four or five years or whatever else, but you know, uh, this is a big job. And so we gave Writers Tears last year a makeover and it's, we're all delighted with it. The Irishman is getting its makeover this year for next year. So. Yeah, nice. We, it's going to, you know, we want to keep raising our standards in everything from the liquid projects through to the, the, you know, the image that we present to you, whether it's a bottle or a, a box or whatever, everything has got to. So we are always pushing the boundaries and just to do better all the time. And the experimentations on the casks uh, is what dry, drives me because that, you know, we're always trying to, let's find this. Holy Grail. I applaud you, sir, for your for your fantastic whiskies, and I hope you continue to make more. 
but we really appreciate it, Kerry, uh, you giving uh, giving a platform to myself and and the Irish community to talk about uh, new new tastes in Irish whiskey, which we want our friends in the US uh, to really savor and enjoy, and you know challenge yourself as a as a whiskey uh, enthusiast or consumer in the US challenge yourself say well you know I know I always buy Johnny X or Johnny Y uh, but you know look at the Irish portfolio and just try the, the new taste coming out of Ireland and in particular yeah. the Irishman and writers tears just a beautiful they are they're beautiful thank you so much don't touch that device we'll be right back with whiskey whereabouts well, we are back with Bernard Welsh. Last time we spoke, it was a couple months back, and we had a few things going on. You had a new expression coming out to the States in the late fall, early winter, and that time is now. So I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit more about that expression. Yeah, well, great news. Um, we have launched Rider's Tears uh, in a skill and ice wine cask finish. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with ice wine, but... Uh, uh, in Canada, it's quite big. And um, well, from the first time I went to Canada, I was introduced to ice wine. Um, I absolutely loved it. I have a sweet tooth. And every time I return home, I'd always bring back some ice wine. Um, I wanted to do something, uh, I suppose, deep in the connections that we have with North America. And uh, I was really fortunate in that the guys in Inniskillen, which would be the leading and was the, pre the first, the premier uh, ice wine winery in Canada. Um, I was really fortunate that they basically let me access their, their barrel room. We sampled, we selected some amazing casks and we brought them back to Ireland where we um, finished Rider's Tears for 12 months in the ice wine cask and the, the resultant liquid, the result of whiskey is just stunning and that has now been released so it has arrived in the us despite all the challenges with COVID and getting things uh, shipped in it is there um uh, there's not it's a limit it's a limited release um there's uh, only so many uh, it was 12 casts that we brought across to ireland of which uh, you know only i think it was uh, five of them made, made their way to the us so um yeah the I'm really excited about it. It's a just a, a phenomenal uh, finish. Awesome. So for those who don't know what ice wine is, is it a white wine? Is it a red wine? Is it a, what is it? It uh, can be both. Um, so in a skill and work with both red and white, uh, the uh, Vidal grape is the one that's predominantly used at in a skill and it's got a thicker skin, harder. It's able to take the, the harsh winters which they have a, up in Niagara on the lake. And um, so that's what we have selected is the Gold Vidal, which was uh, just absolutely stunning ice wines. Very, uh, I have a sweet tooth and it just, uh, it's worked wonderfully well uh, with Rider's Tears, which had that hint of sweetness, the, the, the vanilla from the bourbon barrel already in there. And now you're layering on, if you like this, and. It, it's a, it's a natural sweetness that you get from the ice wine as opposed to, let's say, the, the fortified wines we get here in Europe. That's awesome. I will totally start looking for that in stores. Now, one other thing I wanted to ask you about that we did not discuss last time we chatted, it didn't even seem like it was on the horizon, was this recent acquisition with Amber Beverages. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it, this came left field. It was not, a, you know, it wasn't something that we were... Uh, out there looking in market, uh, this company Amber Beverage, which uh, you may know about, they're quite a large uh, European uh, drinks firm, and uh, we know them quite well here uh, in Ireland because of the routes to market that they own through Europe. So um, we worked with Mountain Spirits in Austria, for example, and uh, Amber own Mountain Spirits, so we were very familiar with them. Uh, you know, quite a big player here. Um, but basically, they fell in love with our brands, Riders Tears and The Irishman, and um, came knocking, and we sort of sort of pushed them away. We're not, not interested, but they came, they came back with an offer that we just couldn't refuse. And the beauty for me is that they've asked me to run their whiskey business, which uh, Riders Tears and The Irishman would be absolutely center uh, center stage. So we're, we're, up, we're up and running. 
we're up and running awesome, and uh, awesome. I'm, I'm 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 here in ireland um uh, they've got some very exciting plans in the whiskey space so again i would love to speak to you uh this time next year and to see you know how far down the road we've come but there's a lot of exciting things to happen uh yeah really Fantastic. Well, that's very exciting news. And we are so excited to have you here on our premiere episode of Barrel Room Chronicles. And thanks again for joining us. Kerry, as always, it's a pleasure. I got a toast to you and your, 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 your listeners. Uh, happy Christmas to everybody. For show notes on today's episode, please visit www.barrelroomchronicles.com. If you like what you heard, please rate and subscribe to the podcast. If you really liked it and you want to show your support, buy us a whiskey through our Kofi site. If you work in the whiskey industry or run a whiskey bar or club and you'd like to be featured on Barrel Room Chronicles, register to be a guest through our website. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, Salangeva. Barrel Room Chronicles is a production of First Real Entertainment and is distributed by Anchor FM and is available on Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and wherever fine podcasts can be heard.